Welcome to the Scholar's Chair. It was W.E.B. Du Bois who said, and here lies the tragedy of the age. Not that men are poor, all men know something of poverty. Not that men are wicked, who is good? Not that men are arrogant or ignorant, what is truth? Nay, but that men know so little of others. He further wrote that there is but one coward on earth, and that is the coward that dares not to know. Tonight, an introduction to the words and deeds of American sociologist, historian, civil rights activist, author, and editor, Dr. Wim Edward Burkhardt Du Bois. Tonight on the Scholars Chair, we have three educators, starting with Mr. Robinson. The, here we have at the table Dr. D. Osai Robinson, Assistant Professor of Government at Bowie State University. He has earned his PhD from Howard University. Also at the table is Dr. Corey Brown, Associate Professor of History at Prince George's Community College. He earned his PhD in history from Howard University. And finally, Mr. J. Sango, Assistant Professor of History in the Department of History at Prince George's County Community College, and he's the Director of the African American Studies Program at the, at the Institute, Studies Institute, right? All right, don't forget, just correct me, all right? Welcome to the Scholars Chair, guys. Uh, I want to start with the first question. Who is this man we've been talking about? Who is W.E.B. Uh, du Bois? Uh, I have just some sketch information about him. I do know that he lived or he was born in 1868 in Massachusetts, and, and, and I know he died in August 27th, 1963. He lives a total lifespan of 95 years. I understand he, he dies in Ghana. Right. Is it Ghana? Mm -hmm. and, um, he uh, did a lot of his education, as a, he did a lot of teaching at Atlanta University. That's what we're going to cover, basically. We're going to cover his time period at Atlantic University. We know he's an author. He wrote uh, The Souls of Black Folks. He wrote The Black Rest um, uh, Reconstruction in America, and he was the editor of the Crisis Magazine. Some general basic information. Tell me, what are your views, uh, your personal views of, of this uh, great scholar, uh, Mr. Dr. Robinson? Uh, well, Du Bois, it's, in my view, is the preeminent African-American scholar in history. Uh, his influence is almost like a giant uh, as casting down uh, as on, in terms of African-American history and, in, uh, I would say, American intellectuals in general. Um, I like to say Du Bois is almost like a rites of passage that anybody that's a serious African-American scholar, you have to wrestle with Du Bois at a certain point and even beyond his scholarship his legacy as an activist with the NAACP and also his influence in the beginnings of the Pan-African movement are notable mm -hmm. so his mm -hmm. accomplishments uh, we could talk on and on about his various accomplishments mm -hmm. that's the truth because he, he lives 90, 95 years so that's, that's a lot of time to make something happen Dr. Brown what are your views? Well for me Du Bois is an example of the faulty nature of the idea that black people were um, inferior. Mm -hmm. He set the example that he challenged every single stereotype of black people of, of you know, raising be far beyond people's expectation of, of course, black people, but of most people at that time. He continually challenged the notion that a black person is inferior and inspired other people to do the same. So for me, Du Bois is, is just proof positive that black folks are, as my grandfather said, at least as good as anybody else. That's, that's true. I th it seems to me that most of his research was about that. How do, how do we actually 
uh, get empirical proof in terms of making that very point that these people are are uh, are just as good as everyone else in society. Sango, what are your views? Um, one of the most recent and comprehensive biographies on Du Bois was published by David Levering Lewis. Mm -hmm. And Du Bois was, uh, is often quoted for his uh, statement, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Well, his biographer, David Levering Lewis, said the problem for him was the problem of trying to uh, deal with the complexity of W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. Not just the complexity of his thought, but the complexity of his activities, his activism. Mm -hmm. For me, Du Bois uh, personifies that complexity of African-American thought. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we have a tendency to oversimplify uh, African-American intellectuals. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to freeze them in time and to box them in certain categories or pigeonhole them in certain categories. But it's very difficult to do that with someone like Du Bois. Mm -hmm. His range of ideas, his range of activities, just the sheer length of his lifespan alone I think reminds us of the fact that we have to take African American intellectuals seriously mm -hmm. and we have to deal with the complexity of their thought just like we would deal with the complexity of any intellect that America has produced. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, his contribution, let's focus in on a little bit of that, you know, uh, it, do we have a, a a, a, a broad or complete picture of American history without Du Bois, and and that just goes to the to the uh, to the the question is it is that with Du Bois writings how do, does he make us better understand the African American historical narrative? Um, well, in a, a variety of ways, um, I believe, uh, as as Professor Shango mentioned, uh, his complexity and also his various contributions. I mean, you have the more scientific side of Du Bois, but you also have to realize that he's also a brilliant literary writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was an excellent writer. Um, he, he wrote fiction novels in addition to his more empirically rigorous works. Uh, so I believe Du Bois gives a reflection not only in issues of uh, the color line, but also the tensions that America has wrestled with. You see him wrestling with that uh, throughout his works, and I th think you see the growth of America, even in that period as he saw um, immigrants from Western Europe coming and noticing how they were trying to adapt many of the racist views of whites in America as a time. Mm -hmm. uh, these are things that I think you can make a parallel even today with some of the, the uncertainties, uh, uneasiness that some uh, Americans may have with the shifting demographics in America. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of parallels in Du Bois' work um, and also uh, even with the souls of black folk where he tries to tie, tie it into um, the strength of the soul and, and of the spirit in reference to African Americans, but you get this reflection in America in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Historical narrative, is, does he make a contribution to our understanding of the African American historical narrative? Uh, he makes a very significant contribution, particularly uh, when we talk about the role of scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about the role, not just of scholars, but scholars who also immerse themselves in social activities and political activism. Uh, that's very central when you talk about the African American experience. And again, I think uh, Du Bois personifies the commitment to using uh, intellectual pursuits and scholarly work to advance humanity mm -hmm. and to advance society as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very remarkable contribution. Uh, and it, it's also a testament of the power of education, mm -hmm. the power of ideas. Uh, and how influential those ideas can be in a given society. He had a great, a great love for science, huh? Yes. Yes. Was, uh, that, was, was that part of his training, of course? And 
It, it was, I mean, this is the fascinating thing about Du Bois' training. You have a person that, that in essence could have earned two PhDs, one from Harvard, and he basically had everything he needed while he was studying in Berlin for a second PhD. So he had been exposed to the cutting edge met methods in terms of scientific research, but it's also his feeling that through rigorous scientific research, you could reveal the truth about the African-American experience mm -hmm. and maybe idealistically at the time by mainstream America seeing the truth that would change his views. It was a perspective that he later altered uh, mm -hmm. after his years in Atlanta, mm -hmm. but he did feel as though rigorous scientific research would lead to a certain enlightenment, uh, if you want to put him in that frame of thinking, mm -hmm. Uh, to, to wide open people's eyes in terms of the, sh the humanness mm -hmm. of African Americans. Mm -hmm. So there was a certain reliance on the scientific he, method he's with saying, that. He's saying there's a man uh, going down the road in, into research, so, in sociology, and he turns, his, he turns his activity towards more political activism. Mm -hmm. Why is that, Dr. Rao, you think? <laughs> because essentially, he could be a quiet public scholar, like we talk, I mean, a quiet scholar writing books, mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to do that and have any kind of success in the, you know, he's, he's writing at the tail end of the nadir. I mean, mm -hmm. the struggle of black people at this time is lo the lowest point. There's increasing in the, the growth of segregation, uh, race, Race rioting is at the doorstep, lynching at, a, at the doorstep. Mm -hmm. If he would to quietly write his books and say nothing, there'd be a limited ability for him to have any kind of access with his own writings. Mm -hmm. But also, he and people like who look like him would suffer, especially people you know who did not have the, his education would suffer far, far much. But even if he could get beyond that, mm -hmm. there's only a certain level that he could go to. So for him, there was no option but to speak out. Speak out. Why did he advocate violence? Why didn't he? Uh, I don't think that violence would have produced the long-term results that Du Bois was seeking. Mm -hmm. uh, it may have generated a temporary remedy, or it may have uh, exacerbated this situation, particularly for African Americans. So, outnumbered. So what was the goal? I mean, what would what would what would he thought the goal should be? Uh, I think his moment. ultimate goal was greater racial understanding, mm -hmm. which he thought would lead to greater racial harmony. Mm -hmm. uh, he, of course, uh, was committed to African-American upliftment, to African-American struggle, uh, but he was also a humanist. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also concerned about common, working class, ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And I think that, in many instances, uh, pushed his struggle even further. Mm -hmm. uh, but violence, I don't think Du Bois thought would have produced that type of long-term uh, goal of racial understanding and racial harmony that he was seeking. In okay. fact, it probably would have made that struggle even more difficult, which he witnessed in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. so, so from from uh, uh, from Washington to, to King, essentially, that's, right. that's, that, that was the, 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 the path. Right. Um, I wanted to talk about in studying this great scholar, um, do you think his writings would be, re uh, is his writings relevant to the contemporary African American today, Dr. Brown? And why, essentially? Well, so much of his writings mm -hmm. um, is essentially about the question of identity, mm -hmm. I mean, especially when we talk about the opening essays in um, The Souls of Black Folks. Mm -hmm. Um, he really takes it that, I, like, I, when I have my classes my, on my syllabus, on my syllabi, uh, I have a quote from the Souls of Black Folks talking about, you know, the Negro is sort of a seven son born on, with a veil and gifted with a second sight in this American world, and that the struggle of black folks are essentially how does a black person become both, you know, a Negro. Mm -hmm and an American, this mm -hmm. double consciousness, double consciousness yeah. this double consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it is my belief in any way that any black person, you could pretty put any group of people, part of their, you know, growing up, part of their struggles in life is finding out who they are mm -hmm. and where they fit into the world. Mm -hmm. So if you solely look at beyond the academic studies, uh, 
if you look at Du Bois from the perspective of how do I, as a modern day person, find out who I am and how I fit into this world? Mm -hmm. um, du Bois is that's one of the central questions he's he's always challenging people to 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 not just accept what others say about who you are, mm -hmm. but to understand that you that you and people like you have long played a role in this world mm -hmm. and there is there is no world even if people don't acknowledge it without you mm -hmm. so yeah, i think du bois um, just on the identity questions fit into today's society today's society double consciousness does he offers us a path a path that we can an additional path as dr brown has uh, has uh, laid out for us he offers us um Double conscious, I, Du Bois' wrestling with identity is is very complex, particularly even to today in terms of the various growth, the growth that African Americans have experienced. I mean, I think you can make an argument that even the tensions that, that lie, lie behind the veil when Du Bois was talking about may not be the same, but we can still highlight various identity questions that are still here today mm -hmm. uh, and then when you talk about African Americans everything from from complexionism to things of that nature and there's also a, a, a side of Du Bois that was uh, as, as Professor Shango briefly mentioned there was a class consciousness that he was aware of but he didn't he never really or in that at that period never got, got in depth into simply because he recognized with the socialist and communist movements there was still racism. Uh -huh. So he was he understood the struggle that workers still that had, that had at that point and the exploitation yes. that they were exposed to even today that we witness in America with the, the so-called 99 percent mm -hmm. movement that tried to highlight the discrepancies, discrepancies between the wealthy mm -hmm. and the overall bulk of Americans. One percent, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, high one percent. Double consciousness, you have, you have an extension? Um, I think it's very important to emphasize, even with Du Bois' notion of double consciousness, that he was committed to the preservation of African American culture mm -hmm. and the preservation of the African American heritage. I don't think he was at a point where he wanted to abandon African American culture. It was still at the fore uh, of his academic work, his appreciation for African American culture. This so, unique African. Right, right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you can have this duality or this dual consciousness that mm -hmm. Du Bois frequently spoke of, but I think it's also important, and he talks about this in an essay of uh, little known even among academic circles, uh, the conservation of the races, uh, where he basically uh, made the argument that African American culture is a very integral part of American culture. And even in embracing that Americanness or that American identity, there should still be an emphasis on appreciating and expressing various aspects of African American what, culture. What, and I or think what it means to be American really. Yeah, right. Two, right. Two bodies but not giving up either part. Right. Not giving up the Negro to be right. an American. Right. And interesting. Right. He also did what I found very interesting is and it's what got me focused on this particular chapter was this writing about capitalism. Right. Um, and, and he 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 criticized um, the capitalists uh, quite a bit in his writings, but particularly in this particular chapter. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? It, it seems to me that he, he really had some concerns, uh, Dr. Robinson, about how government and capitalists and even the Supreme Court were, were kind of in bed together. Well, he, he's, he obviously was of the view that uh, wealth had more influence and in general was exploiting everyone else, and, and you know, obviously uh, African Americans. Yes. Uh, and this is, you know, you're getting into these populist progressive periods in history and you have the robber barons, you have the Carnegies, you have the Rockefellers, these people that are worth um, tremendous amounts mm -hmm. and the exploitation is, is, is obvious to everyone. Mm -hmm. And he even remarked in that chapter that when the populist fervor had gotten to a certain peak that not, not even that wealthy influence could stop the need for changes, but you get the Supreme Court weighing in yes. on decisions. Yes. So I think he's starting to witness the influence of capitalism and the fact that um, 
politics and economics mm -hmm. are fundamentally married, mm -hmm. uh, and that to understand the struggle, struggle and depth that that blacks faced, it was something that you had to be cognizant of. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was a very interesting idea, especially in light of the contemporary Wall Street uh, challenge we're having mm -hmm. today. Uh, that here this heard this man at at the, the eve of the 20, 20th century is 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 writing about the same problem, you know. Right. Uh, the the criticism on capitalism, what, you think it was kind of a kind of a a, a double consciousness on DeFore's part in, in, in the sense that he relied so much on, as well as Booker T, relied so much on donations and and uh, uh, char charitable giving of of wealthy individuals and organizations. Right. And, uh, and at the same time, he was not afraid to write about uh, capitalists, uh, right. uh, just total domination and capture right. of the American government. What are, your, what are your thoughts? Well, I think fundamentally, Du Bois was about the working class. Mm -hmm. That's where his concerns principally lie. Uh, and when you talk about the working class, the wage earners, the servants, the laborers, you know, a good portion of that is going to include the African American populace. Yes. Uh, so he, you know, even though he did receive support, philanthropic support uh, from benefactors, he still understood the tension uh, between the have and have-nots. Uh, particularly when you talk about the chapter in the autobiography, uh, there was an increasing amount of strikes in the steel industry, mm -hmm. uh, various forms of strikes. Uh, where you see workers uniting. Mm -hmm. And one of the criticisms of capitalism, particularly the role of government in the Supreme Court even, is that you have the strikers being portrayed as lawless <laughs> citizens. Right, right. Uh, on the verge possibly of even anarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Du Bois recognized that the federal government uh, could have done more uh, for the cause of the workers, mm -hmm. but chose not to in many instances, mm -hmm. particularly when you talk about strikes. Yes. Uh, and so he just saw the government, the Supreme Court, and various big business uh, representatives pretty much, you know, in the same um, fold, mm -hmm. if you will. Dr. Dr. Brown? Um, uh, well, you talk about, well, the, the problem with capitalism is that, well, I shouldn't say the problem, the reality of capitalism is that Capitalism does create a situation where um, a person who starts off with nothing or little, mm -hmm. in theory, can, you know, become great. And, yeah. You know, and you have these examples of these self-made men at that this so-called so self-made men at this time period. Right. Um, but it also relies on there to be almost a permanent underclass mm -hmm. of people. Cheap labor. Cheap right. labor. Mm -hmm. just, um, and for the haves to have undue power over the have-nots. Mm -hmm. Um, and as Professor Shango was noting, like he, he wanted to you know, have these concentrations on the workers and all of you know, media, the powerful elite portraying the, those who are on strike as the problem. Mm -hmm. now, if they would, you know, if they would mm -hmm. s submit to you know, the, the, the people who rightfully, by, by social Darwinist <laughs> terms, who have, if they, should, if they would just submit, sure. they would be able to, to, to reap the rewards. Yeah. Uh, but also a problem with, you know, to embrace the working class, part of that is also predicated on this racial antagonism. Mm. Because you had workers of different, of the same or similar classes, mm -hmm. but one's black and one's white, and s instead of unify as the working class. Right. Um, the cap, yeah. Quality even there, the haves can mm -hmm. set the poor white worker mm -hmm. against the poor black worker, mm -hmm. and the two groups fight amongst each other. Right. And mm -hmm. the poor white worker, if they go on strike, and the capitalists, because you know black people are segregated and and they this need to survive, and then the capitalist hires the black scabs mm -hmm. instead of the white working class saying, you know. Maybe we should help these people join our union. Mm -hmm. We, you know, mm -hmm. they're taking our jobs. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it sounds like a familiar story. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just gave me a signal for five minutes, but I wanted to, to do this. Um, 
Why is it that, that uh, at the same time, in the same period of time, that Booker T doesn't have this same antagonistic view or position against wealthy individuals uh, or, or against government, for that matter? I don't remember reading, and I have, I'm not, a, I'm not in, in a scholar by no means, but, but I, I don't remember him having the same antagonistic view. Uh, matter of fact, I think uh, Du Bois called him a, an appeaser. You know, um, why isn't it that you think that Booker T didn't have this problem? Well, uh, it's the Atlantic Compromise. There's nothing about Booker T on the surface that was antagonistic mm -hmm. towards whites. Uh, and the discussion I've had in classrooms and debates with colleagues is the question of you have one individual that's growing up in the South, right. that lives in the South. You have another person that's basically a transplant what impact does that have on one's philosophy? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's one thing to talk about some of the rhetoric that was associated with Du Bois when you're coming from a, a New England uh, point of view. Yes. It's another thing <laughs> yes. to talk about these things when you're living in Alabama okay. or you're living in Mississippi or, or in, in Georgia because mm -hmm. I think uh, and, and this is, I don't get into the, the, just as I feel as though we can't box or Du Bois in his views, mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington was much more complex than just the surface mm -hmm. accommodationist. There were certain things that he did behind the scenes yeah. in Tuskegee, Alabama that tried to aid blacks in a generic way. But I think the environment and he feeling as though that the best possible strategy for us to achieve our goal mm -hmm. was to take a more accommodationist stance, a stance, excuse me, mm -hmm. with the benefactors because we are relying on the Carnegies or the Rockefellers or who have you mm -hmm. for funding, um, and that that led him to a different place in terms of his goals. Mm -hmm. um, so you, it's 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 an interesting dimension between these two great individuals yes, and, and what their yes. ultimate goals really, were. Really worth studying. I, I, I advise anyone to read, read them and read them carefully yeah. uh, as, you're, as you're, uh, you're directing us to do. He talks about racism as being not only a domestic problem but also an international problem, a foreign, a foreign policy problem. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of people who would say that that is present in, in our day and time. Uh, does he offer us a solution, and if the solution is, uh, what would be his, uh, Du Bois's solution to domestic racism as well as um, foreign, foreign policy being made based on racism? Uh, Dr. Brown, I'll go with you and we'll go around. For him, I guess his solution was primarily the idea of education. For right or wrong, he believed the, the more educated one was, the more exposed to the, they are to this idea of that black people were not inferior or the other is not so other, mm -hmm. that they would you know, be enlightened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure he was correct in that total ass assertion, um, but he had the idea that the more educated one was, the better off that people would be. And, it, and it's a specific type of education. Uh, I think Du Bois strongly believed that white America needed to be more educated about black America and the contributions that African Americans have made to this country, and vice versa. You know, that if these two groups could understand each other and be educated to understand each other more, then that would alleviate some of the racial tension, and it's global. Mm -hmm. um, That's an excellent point of view. Very quickly, what book would your students, uh, would you recommend your students read? One book. One book? One book. Uh, well, it's hard to go against souls, but as we've been discussing, Du Bois has his other autobiographies. So I, I would say the souls of black folk, uh, and you know, of course you have the, the, um, the biographies by David Laverne Lewis. Souls of black folks, all right then. I'm gonna have to take that one as the last answer of the day, but quickly, a, a quick title? Uh, black Reconstruction. Black Reconstruction, all right. That is another scholar's chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown, uh, uh, Sango, Dr. Br uh, Dr. Brown, Dr. Robinson. <laughs> thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, if you want to know more about the scholar's chair, you can catch us online at YouTube uh, at uh, Read One Communications. You can also send us an email at uh, uh, Shadid, at our scholar's chair at gmail.com. I look forward to seeing you next time. I'm Khalil Shadid. Good night. <laughs>